chosen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Five-minute vote. It's the rule vote for the defense authorization bill. The rule would allow for 172 amendments to be considered, addressing issues such as the treatment of Guantanamo Bay detainees, sexual assaults in the military, NSA data collection, and the war in Afghanistan. Two proposed amendments to the bill will not be considered. Two that propose to remove the decision to prosecute sexual assault cases from the chain of command. They will not receive votes on the House floor. The House Rules Committee declared the two amendments out of order. Uh, yesterday. So, final, uh, not final passage, the rule vote here and ahead consideration of 172 amendments. And during the remainder of this vote, we're going to bring you the comments of House Speaker John Boehner and his briefing earlier today. Morning, everyone. Morning. Uh, last week's uh, job report was more of the same uh, slow growth, uh, modest job gains. Uh, stagnant wages and millions of Americans uh, who remain out of work. Uh, the Obama administration uh, predicted that the unemployment rate would be 5% today if uh, the Congress enacted their stimulus bill. Well, we're at 7.6%, and uh, I think we can certainly do better. Republicans uh, have a plan for robust economic job growth uh, in our country. As part of our jobs plan, Republicans have passed a bill to fix the student loan program and stop rates from doubling, uh, making it easier for uh, students and their families uh, to make their payments and afford college. It actually mirrors a plan proposed in the President's budget, but the Democrat-controlled Senate has refused to pass it, uh, or any bill for that matter, to solve the problem. So I'm now concerned that the President and his party uh, have to, decided to deliberately allow rates to rise on students and families after July the 1st. Instead of engaging uh, with the House and Senate uh, Republicans to enact a student loan fix uh, that we all agree is needed, uh, they seem to be intent on picking a fake fight uh, to create some kind of a distraction. Uh, they hope this fake fight uh, will mask the divisions within their own party uh, that's blocking enactment of a solution. Uh, the, the consequences of this uh, cynical political strategy are real. It could lead uh, to rates rising on uh, students and families uh, on July the 1st, at a time when they can least afford it. Uh, this poster highlights uh, how the President's party uh, are uh, picking this fight. On April the 10th, the President uh, releases a budget that calls for a change uh, to a market-based interest rate for student loans. On May 9th, Chairman Klein introduced the, the Smarter Solutions for Students Act, a plan similar to what was outlined in the President's budget. Uh, on May 22nd, uh, as Republicans prepare uh, to pass Chairman Klein's bill, uh, mirroring what the President's called for, the White House decides to issue a veto threat. And today, uh, after uh, the House has acted, the Senate still has not passed a bill to deal with this problem. Uh, the simple truth is the President has run into a road roadblock, and that roadblock is his own party uh, over in the Senate. He can't get the Senate to pass uh, his bill, uh, so the White House has resorted to picking this fight to try to mask the divisions within their own, within their own party. So we need the President uh, to show the courage and the leadership uh, to help bring them along and resolve this issue. Republicans have acted. Uh, we've done our job. It's time for the president and his party to do their job. Mr. Speaker, next week the House will take up an issue, um, the issue of abortion. And it stands as of now no chance of passing in the Senate. Do you think that you guys should be spending so much time on these issues that have no chance of going any further? Uh, jobs uh, continues to be uh, our number one concern. And uh, while we continue to be focused on this, there are other important issues that we have to deal with. And after uh, the Kermit uh, Gosnell case uh, and the publicity that it received, I think the legislation is appropriate, and uh, I hope those who have voted against such proposals in the past will change their minds. Speaker Banner, uh, after that bipartisan meeting uh, that you guys had with NSA officials, that briefing, some members of your own party, and even Democrats, were saying, 
there should be, we should relook at Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Would you be in favor of relooking at that? Would you allow for that type of legislation to go on the House floor? Uh, I think uh, both the Judiciary Committee uh, and uh, the Intelligence Committees are, are continuing to provide oversight on this issue. And uh, I frankly would look to them. I'm not uh, familiar with Section 215, uh, but uh, there's been a lot of oversight over these programs, and I expect it will continue. How did your meeting go yesterday with the Sandy Hook families, and did you give them any sort of assurances that the House will act on significant reforms this year? Well, our hearts go out to, to these families and, uh, uh, and the victims of this horrible tragedy and others like it. Uh, we did have a nice meeting uh, with the Sandy Hook families yesterday, Mr. Cantor and I, and, uh, and Mr. Gowdy came on behalf of Chairman Goodlatte. Uh, but it was a good meeting, but it was a private meeting, and I'll leave it at that. But, uh, did it leave you with any new thoughts about ways to tackle the nation's gun problems? The Chairman Goodlatte uh, and his committee are, have continued to look uh, at the existing laws and how they can be improved. Uh, Tim Murphy, our colleague from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, has done an awful lot of work over at uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, looking at the issue of mental health. Uh, and how that would play into this. Uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that uh, they'll continue their work. Mr. Alexander is here in the House side this morning and is going to the Senate here in just a little bit here. He's talked a lot about uh, possibly declassifying parts of this program. Isn't that though the concern? How, why is this important to be classified before? And now because the public and frankly many lawmakers don't understand the program, why would it be okay to declassify parts now when it was so important to keep this under wraps previously? Well, as you know, there, there are standards and procedures about what's classified and, and what isn't. And there's uh, always a continuing debate uh, between the Congress and the administration uh, about whether those standards are being applied evenly. Uh, we also know that uh, many times uh, things that uh, were once classified uh, have been declassified, either at the request of, uh, of the White House or at the request of, uh, of the Congress. Uh, and, uh, and so this, this debate about whether it's classified or should have been or maybe not in the future uh, really isn't any different than uh, what we see uh, on a lot of different programs at a lot of different agencies. But isn't this rise to a higher level because you have the public engaged on this issue because they think the government has this wide dragnet out uh, that's picking up every single phone call? I've made it very clear. Uh, this program does not target innocent Americans in any way, shape, or form. These programs have helped keep America safe. Uh, they've enhanced our ability uh, to go after terrorists who want to bring harm uh, to the American people. Uh, and, 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 and frankly, uh, I'm a little surprised uh, that the White House uh, hasn't stood up uh, and, and made clear. On 189, the resolution is adopted. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. House will be in order. For what purpose does the gentleman from California arise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that during further consideration of H.R. 1960, pursuant to House Republican House Resolution 260 Amendments 18, 19, and 20, printed in Part B of House Report 113 to 108, may be considered out of sequence. Without objection, so ordered. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 
appreciate the courtesy. I ask unanimous consent uh, that my statement appear uh, at, immediately after roll call vote 217 and 218. My intended vote should be noted as a ye yes on roll call 217 and a nay on roll call 218, and I would ask that it appear in the appropriate place in the record. Without objection, the gentleman's statement will appear in the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The House it will, will be in order. Will members please clear the well? <laughs> Pursuant to House Resolution 260 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the further consideration of H.R. 1960. Will the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, kindly take the chair? The House is in the Committee of the Whole on the State of the Union for further consideration of the bill, H.R. 1960, of which the clerk will report the title. A bill to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2014 for military activities of the Department of Defense and for military construction to prescribe military personnel strengths for such fiscal year and for other purposes. When the Committee of the Whole rose on Wednesday, June 12, 2013, all time for general debate pursuant to House Resolution 256 had expired. Pursuant to House Resolution 260, no further general debate shall be in order. In lieu of the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Armed Services printed in the bill, it shall be in order to consider as an original bill for the purpose of amendment under the five-minute rule an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee print 113-13 modified by the amendment printed in Part A of House Report 113-108. The amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read. No amendment to that amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be in order except for those printed in Part B of House Report 113-108 and amendments in block described in Section 3 of House Resolution 260, except as provided by the order of the House of today. Each amendment printed in Part B of House Report 113-108 shall be considered only by the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated by the report or in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. It shall be in order at any time for the chair of the Committee on Armed Services or his designee to offer amendments in blanc consisting of amendments printed in Part B of House Report 113-108 not earlier disposed of. Amendments in blanc shall be considered as read, shall be debated for 20 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on the Armed Services or their designees, shall, be subject to, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The original proponent of an amendment included in such amendment in blanc may insert a statement in the congressional record immediately before the disposition of the amendments in blanc. It is now in order to consider amendment number one printed in part B of House Report 113-108. And for what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the amendment. Does the gentleman offer the amendment? I do. This the is a manager's amendment, and it's been worked and agreed to by the minority. It contains technical and conforming changes. It's non-controversial, and I reserve the balance of my time. We'll designate the amendment. 
Amendment number one, printed in Part B of House Report number 113-108, offered by Mr. McKeon of California. So for what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Purpose I just stated, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. The gentleman continue to reserve. <laughs> I reserve. Thank you. For what uh, purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? Uh, though I'm not in opposition uh, to uh, claim the time uh, in opposition. Without objection, gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself the balance of my time just to say I agree with the uh, chairman. Uh, these are technical corrections that we have agreed to, and I urge support. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I ask our colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman, uh, both gentlemen having yielded their time back, the question is now on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number two printed in part B of House Report 113-108. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon rise? Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number two printed in part B of House Report number 113-108 offered by Mr. Blumenauer of Oregon. Pursuant to House Resolution 260, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself two minutes. Um, uh, I appreciate the hard work that minutes. the committee has undertaken. We have before you a bipartisan amendment uh, offered by my colleague, Mr. Mulvaney, and Mr. Benevello, Bellio. The purpose of the amendment is simple. It will help make the naval fleet stronger and more sustainable by allowing the Navy to decide the level of aircraft carriers in the future. Uh, stay at the current level of 10 uh, at some point uh, in the future instead of going back to a congressionally mandated level. It does not eliminate any aircraft carriers. It simply establishes what the entire Department of Defense is in the midst of a major reality check as budgets shrink, priorities change, new technologies emerge. I don't pretend to be a naval expert but our Navy is being pushed into shallow waters as a result of sequestration. And now more than ever, we should allow them to make the decisions. Uh, this, I've been a little concerned that some people in opposition say that this amendment would make a 10-carrier fleet permanent. Nothing could be further from the truth. It simply will allow the Navy to decide if it wants 10 aircraft carriers at some point in the next three decades. Now, if they're afraid this will happen, then it means they think that the Navy five years, 10 years, 20 years from now will decide that they have higher strategic needs. The history of the 11 carrier requirement was imposed for the first time in two centuries by Congress in 2006. That number being unsustainable was reduced to 11 in 2007. That cap still being too high, the Navy, the Navy had to seek a waiver from the Congress to temporarily drop it to 10. Now, if the amendment passes, the Navy will still go back to 11 carriers in 2016 when the Ford is commissioned. But at that point, we should allow the Navy to decide, not people in Congress. And I reserve. Expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? To claim the five minutes in opposition. Gentleman controls five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McIntyre. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you. I rise to oppose this amendment. The Navy is already down to 11 aircraft carriers from a high of 15 during the Cold War. We clearly need these 11 aircraft carriers to maintain a continuous presence in the Middle East, the Western Pacific, and wherever else we may be called upon to go. Protecting our national security interests with our allies such as Israel and Japan and keeping trade lanes open require the fleet of carriers that we have today. Also these carriers allow the U.S. to maintain influence without having a base in a foreign country. Talk about saving money, carriers are in reality mobile bases. 
This is a critical military capability for the United States and it must be maintained. Keeping aircraft carrier production on track is also a major jobs issue. We know that tens of thousands of skilled workers support building and maintaining our aircraft carriers and without them we would soon lose our ability to build large ships of any kind. With that, I yield the remainder of Gentlemen, my time. Uh, time has expired. For what purpose the gentleman from, or the gentleman from Oregon is recognized? I'll reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Virginia, subcommittee chairman on the Armed Service Committee, Mr. Whitman. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Simply put, this amendment seriously jeopardizes national security and also our ability to project power and maintain a forward presence against an ever-growing dangerous world. The backbone of our Navy is our carrier strike force. In order to have seven carriers, we need to have 11. There are carriers that are in port to be refueled, sailors that have to rest. 11 equals seven. Today, we see in the Central Command, they request two aircraft carriers. They're only provided one in the most dangerous area of the world there in the Middle East. If we can't meet the requirements that our commanders are asking for, then why would we want to be reducing the number of carriers? That just doesn't make sense. There's a misconception, too, that because we're moving out of Afghanistan, that somehow there won't be a need for a presence of an aircraft carrier there in the Arabian Gulf. That is absolutely wrong. We need that presence there. The way we maintain that presence is to make sure that we have a minimum of 11 aircraft carriers. Our forward presence is needed today, and we want to make sure that this is done, especially with the reposturing to the Asia Pacific. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to vote against Gentleman's this time amendment. Has expired. The gentleman from Oregon. Uh, recognize my friend from South Carolina for two minutes. Gentleman's recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you can imagine my surprise when I found out that for the last seven years, Congress has been dictating the number of carriers that are in the Navy. Seen for 130 years, we, or excuse me, 230 years, we were, we were satisfied to let the Navy make that decision. And I was just stunned to find out that this was actually happening. I wish I had known I could have offered an amendment to simply get rid of the requirement entirely. But I applaud my friend from Oregon for at least offering this this small improvement. Um, I, I would I would respectfully disagree with my friend from from Virginia. This amendment does, has no impact at all on national security or national defense. Again, there's no impact on national security or national defense. If the amendment passes, the Navy could have 20 carriers next year if the Navy decided that that's what it wanted to do. All we're doing is taking the congressional mandate down from 11 to 10. Um, I go back to the words of former Secretary Gates in 2010 to the Navy League. I thought it was interesting what he said. He said, our current plan is to have 11 carrier strike groups through 2040. To be sure, the need to project power across the seas will never go away, but consider the massive overmatch the U.S. already enjoys. Consider, too, the growing anti-ship capabilities of adversaries. Do we really need 11 carrier strike groups for another 30 years when no other country has more than one? And then importantly, he closed by saying any future plans must address these realities. And that's all we're doing, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and simply giving the Navy more control over how many carriers the Navy has. With all due respect to all of my colleagues in here, I am perfectly, cap uh, perfectly willing to trust the Navy with the operations of our, of our naval warfare, uh, more so than I am Congress. And with that, I ask my friends to support this amendment, which has no impact at all on national defense, but gives more control of the Navy to the experts in the field. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California. Chairman, I yield one minute to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. He beat me. Speaker, um, as long as we're on the subject of you know, the Navy, the Navy actually did report to Congress February 2013 with their force structure assessment, which called for 11 carriers to be in the force, which followed on the strategic review, which President Obama and Secretary Gates conducted in 2011, reported in early 2012, which talked about the repositioning to Asia Pacific, which my friend Mr. Whitman talked about, and in fact um, articulated the fact that we are going to need more naval projection with that shift in st strategy and focus for our country's future uh, uh, national security needs. Strategy should drive decisions here in Congress, both in terms of the defense bill and our budgets. And the Navy has spoken, in fact, with a report which uh, I'd be happy to share with any of my colleagues as early as February of this year, or as recent as February of this year, which clearly articulated an 11 
carrier force is what we need today and fits within the strategic review which we have just exhaustively conducted under the leadership of Secretary Gates and President Obama. And with that, I would yield back uh, and urge a no vote on the amendment. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Oregon has a minute and a half left. The gentleman from California has two minutes. I would, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would yield myself 30 seconds just to say You're recognized. The, the Navy is going to have 11 carriers when the one under construction goes into operation. Nothing in this amendment denies them that. What it says is that subsequently, going out 20 or 30 years, the decision about the minimum level will be left to the Navy, not Congress. I reserve. Gentlemen reserves, gentlemen from California. Mr. Chairman, uh, who has the right to close? California, the gentleman from California, you do. And I, you will have two minutes left. Our, I will reserve our time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Oregon. Then I, I will uh, conclude at this point. I mean, the, it's uh, yield myself the remainder of the time. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Uh, the, the notion here that somehow unless we impose a permanent mandate on the Navy, uh, they are not going to do what the, my friend from Connecticut and Virginia say they're going to do, I think is ludicrous. This is a symbol of Congress micromanaging, substituting its judgment for that of the command structure. Uh, it is, I think, important for us to, in a small way, express confidence in them. They will have their 11 aircraft carriers. Uh, as the uh, Gerald Ford is commissioned, they'll be back at 11. The question is, are we going to have a mandate in perpetuity uh, to substitute our judgment for the realities of the Navy in five years, 10 years, 30 years, regardless of force structure, threats, or technology? This is a small symbol of what's wrong with the process here and why we can't get a control over many of the budget issues. I'd respectfully suggest support for this bipartisan amendment. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from California is now recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of our time to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Forbes, subcommittee chairman on the armed service. Gentleman's recognized for two minutes. I thank the chairman and Chairman, one of the things that unite Republicans and Democrats in opposition to this amendment, that's why you've heard them take this floor, is that the Constitution of the United States mandates Congress to build strong navies. It doesn't mandate the Pentagon, it doesn't mandate the White House, it doesn't mandate anybody, it mandates us and we will not walk away from that mandate. And if you look at every independent analysis, every QDR since 2001 says we need 11 carriers. If you really believe the Navy's going to come in here and say they don't need them, that's not the truth. What's going to happen is somebody's going to give them a budget figure and say the budget needs to drive the strategy and that's why you need to cut it down and we're not going to put them in that position. Three things. They talk about cost. The reality is it could cost more to have fewer carriers because they don't take into consideration the deployment times we're going to put on the backs of our sailors or the turnaround time we're going to have on the increased maintenance costs. The second thing they don't look at is the fact that in 2007 we were able to meet 90 percent of our combatant commanders needs through the Navy. This year we'll only meet 51 percent because of cuts we placed on their backs. But the final thing Mr. Speaker and this is the essence of all of it. They will come in here and the people who will advocate that will say this is acceptable risk. You know what acceptable risk means to them? It means how many ships we can lose, how many men and women we can lose, how much equipment we can lose in a conflict, and still have the potential of winning if every other assumption we've made holds true. Mr. Chairman, we're committed to changing the definition of acceptable risk and saying this, when one of our men and women go into battle, we're going to make sure we've done everything we can reasonably do to make sure they have the, prob the highest probability possible of returning to the country they're fighting for and the families that they love, and you can't do it with fewer than 11 carriers. That's why we're standing with, with this, and that's why I hope we will reject soundly this amendment. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. The question is now on passage of this Second Amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. no. 
In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon rise? We would respectfully request the yeas and nays. Does the gentleman recorded, ask for a recorded, recorded vote? vote? Recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Oregon will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 3, printed in Part B of House Report 113-108. For the purpose, uh, for what purpose does a gentleman from Wyoming, Wyoming? There she is. Mr. Speaker, Rise. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 3, printed in Part B of House Report Number 113-108, offered by Mrs. Lummis of Wyoming. Pursuant to House Resolution 260, the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Mrs. Lummis, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Wyoming. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My amendment is co-sponsored by Mr. Danes of Montana and Mr. Kramer of North Dakota. It would require DOT to maintain all current 450 intercontinental ballistic missile silos in warm status. This amendment would maintain our nuclear triad, where ICBMs, along with submarines and bombers, work together to complicate and deter any attempts at a successful first strike on our country and our allies. China's nuclear arsenal is expanding. Russia and other nuclear states like Pakistan are modernizing. With inexperienced leaders like Kim Jong-un in North Korea, now is the time not to reduce our most reliable and transparent deterrence. President Obama continues to suggest further reductions in U.S. nuclear forces beyond the New START treaty levels and is now bypassing Congress to negotiate directly with President Putin on additional unilateral reductions. It's important for Congress to legislatively require that any final force structure decisions occur in FY15 as currently planned and not be prematurely executed. The ICBM force is in the final stages of more than a decade-long effort to replace and modernize critical mission components. This makes it extremely cost-effective to maintain the Minuteman III fleet over the next two decades. This amendment is budget neutral. It simply keeps silos in warm status so as not to take steps backward that would be costly to reverse at a later date, especially if we encountered unforeseen geopolitical changes. Congress needs to weigh in on the importance of maintaining our land-based forces so the decision is not made without us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And now I wish to yield a minute to the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. George Washington said to be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. Besides the United States and the United Kingdom, the rest of the world has never seriously considered entertaining the idea of eliminating their nuclear weapons. China, France, India, Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, and Russia are all engaged in maintaining, expanding, or modernizing their weapons programs. We should not continue down the path of reduction and degradation of our nuclear programs, including this important ICBM force. The cost of maintaining this force is minor compared to the price tag associated with rebuilding it should we it should we uh, judge incorrectly. Now, some will argue that the U.S. taxpayer is funding the maintenance of weapons never used. I submit, Mr. Chairman, that the U.S. taxpayer is funding the maintenance of weapons being used every day, successfully deterring our enemies from launching their own nuclear weapons. Mr. Chairman, this amendment will save money and may very well save our country. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentlelady from Wyoming reserves. What, for, for what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee rise? I rise in opposition to the amendment. The gentleman controls five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I use, will use such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have the highest regard for the gentlelady from Wyoming. She is an outstanding member of this body. She is doing a superb job of representing her constituents in Wyoming. I haven't had the pleasure of really getting to know the other gentleman, but it is no secret that these three, the sponsors of the amendment, each represent an ICBM uh, missile silo field. Mm -hmm. And these are wonderful bases in our fine country. But these are also bases that we should not uh, give a blank check to and allow to flourish in perpetuity. The Cold War is over. 
Our men and women in uniform, led by our generals and admirals, are making some very important decisions about the best way to structure our triad, not to in any way give up on the triad, but to accommodate such things as, for example, the New START Treaty, which was overwhelmingly ratified by the other body just a few years ago. There are lots of technical factors having to do with these silo fields and with the capability of Miniman 3 missiles. Uh, there are lots of technical factors having to do with the other elements of our triad. But I would urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment, despite the fine qualities of the sponsors of this amendment. Because what's good for a missile base in Wyoming is not necessarily good for American defense policy. And while I uh, uh, have the highest admiration for the gentlelady from Wisconsin, we really need to put this in perspective. Uh, this should be seriously considered by our colleagues, and I would urge them at this point to uh, reject the amendment overwhelmingly. I would like to uh, yield two minutes to the uh, rank. Well, I'll reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves, uh, gentlelady from Wyoming. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you. I would uh, yield uh, 90 seconds to the gentleman from Montana, Mr. Daines. Gentleman is recognized for 90 seconds. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank Representative Lummis for her leadership on this critically important issue and show my strong support for this amendment, which I've joined her and our friend from North Dakota in introducing today. Our nation's intercontinental ballistic missiles are a vital component of our nuclear deterrent strategy to keep the American people safe from mankind's most dangerous threat. And for several decades, this peace through strength policy has worked. Malmstrom Air Force Base in Great Falls, Montana is home to 150 of our nation's ICBMs. I recently visited Malmstrom and met with the leaders of the 346th Missile Wing to discuss the importance of our ICBM mission to our national security. In fact, at the conclusion of the visit, Colonel Robert Stanley, the commander at Malmstrom, gave me this commander's coin. The motto in Boston it summarizes why our defense strategy is effective, and let me read it. It says this, scaring the hell out of America's enemies since 1962. I am grateful for their role in keeping America secure and their enormous contributions to Montana. I believe it would be deeply unwise to rewrite our effective policy for peace. Our potential adversaries in the 21st century may differ than those during the Cold War, but a comprehensive nuclear deterrence capability will remain crucial to our national security. Our amendment requires the Pentagon to keep our ICBM silos in warm status even as adjustments pursuant to the New START Treaty are made. It will keep potential adversaries at bay and ensure that our crucial nuclear force remains flexible and responsive. I urge all my colleagues to vote for it, and I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentlelady from Wyoming Reserves. Gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield two minutes to the ranking member of the Armed Services Committee, Mr. Smith of Washington. The gentleman from Washington is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's two very compelling reasons to oppose this amendment. First of all, this is, again, not recognizing the reality of sequestration and the defense budget. The way Congress seems to have reacted to the reality of the fact that the defense budget has already been cut substantially, that sequestration, which nobody uh, seems to want to put forward a plan to get rid of, or certainly won't pass the House and the Senate, is the defense budget is going to be cut. So the way Congress reacts is, okay, fine, but I have to protect mine. Don't close my base, don't you know, shut down a ship, don't shut down a plane, don't move anything out of the National Guard. All of this is, is an effort to preserve in these three states their military presence, which means money. And I get that, but the Pentagon is going to have to reduce their budget. And every time we pass one of these things that says you can't do this and you can't save money here and you can't save money there, we are creating a hollow force. The Pentagon will not have the funds necessary to train our troops to be ready to perform the missions that we need to if they can't save money anywhere because Congress has stepped in and said you can't because it's mine and I don't want to give it up. Second reason is we have well over 5,000 nuclear weapons. We will be amply able to scare the living crap out of everybody in the world for a very long time, even if we reduce that somewhat and sensibly. This amendment just cramps the ability of the Pentagon to make those types of sensible decisions. It will not eliminate our nuclear deterrence. Our nuclear deterrence is overwhelming. There is money to be saved in the nuclear programs. The Pentagon can sensibly do that, but here comes Congress again to say, I have to protect my own. I don't care what it does to the budget. Fiscal conservatives should not support this amendment. 
We've got to get our budget in order. We've got to do it logically. And logically is not protect mine and I don't care about the big picture. That's not the way to approach this budget if we're going to have an adequate national security. Gentleman's time is expired. A gentleman from Ten uh, Tennessee Reserves, gentlewoman from Wyoming is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield 30 seconds to the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Rogers. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized for 30 seconds. I thank the gentlelady and thank the speaker. As chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, I rise in support of this amendment. And I don't have any silos in Alabama, although I'd like to have some. Uh, one of the things I want people to be cognizant of is we need to maintain our resiliency as we go through the negotiations. The New START Treaty does not require these silos be demolished. Uh, the fact is, as we just learned with our ground-based interceptors, which President Obama decided four years ago to reduce from 44 to 30, he reversed course when the world got a little bit more dangerous, and now we're going back to put those additional 14 GBIs in Fort Greeley. We never know when the world's landscape is going to change. It is much more expensive to try and cumbersome to put new silos in than it is to keep these warm. I urge my uh, colleagues to vote yes on this amendment. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, gentlewoman from Wyoming Reserves. Gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Mr. Chairman, how much time do I have remaining? Gentleman from Tennessee has a minute and a half. Gentlewoman, Mr. time has expired. Mr. Chairman, uh, let me close. Again, I have the highest regard for the gentlelady from West Wyoming. But this is an uh, issue of national importance. We should not allow parochial concerns to dominate here. Uh, she is doing an extraordinary job of representing her constituents, particularly those at that base. But I would urge, uh, particularly my colleague from North Dakota, to be aware that to the extent he preserves these ICBM missile fields, he may be hurting unintentionally uh, his nuclear-capable bomber force. So watch out. If you're going to be parochial, let's go all the way and be thoroughly parochial and don't leave part out. So this is a very important thing. We realize as members we should put the national interest first. Let's listen to the Air Force. Let's listen to STRATCOM. Let's not make pork barrel decisions back home that may be benefit us politically but are not in the national interest. We're all for a strong national defense, and I think there is overwhelming and bipartisan opposition to this amendment. So I would urge my colleagues to strongly and forcefully oppose it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Wyoming. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Chair. For what purpose does the gentleman? Uh, pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered uh, by the gentlewoman from Wyoming will be postponed. It is now in order to consider amendment number four, printed in part B of House Report 113-108. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Mexico seek recognition? The clerk will designate, designate the amendment. Amendment number four, printed in part B of House Report number 113-108, offered by Mr. Pierce the, of New Mexico. Uh, amendment be read. Okay. Pursuant to House Resolution 260, the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself a minute and a half. And uh, right now, emerging technologies critical to our readiness and safety of our soldiers is developed at 23 major range and test facilities within DOD. Recently, a problem has come to our attention, and that problem plays out in the, in the White Sands Missile Range that's in my district. Basically, this center piece of the range is controlled by DOD, the land and the air above it. But these pieces here, the north and the south, are controlled, the air is controlled by the Department of Defense, the uh, Secretary of the Army, but the land is controlled by the BLM. And the BLM recently has approved something that uh, an encroachment across this, this land, which threatens 33% of the missions in White Sands. There's a launch facility that is up in this very northern corner, and we use the entire 140 mile length. It's the largest overland test base, and we use that, that uh, to, to test these new emerging technologies. 
with the the encroachment, then it endangers one fully one third of the missions uh, of the base. So our amendment simply says that that no secretary of any agency should be able to come in here and and put at risk these tests of the 23 different sites uh, located with DoD and uh, with a split jurisdiction like we have here. It's a very simple amendment. It simply says uh, that you got to go through the process and ask the people here. Uh, with that, I would reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington seek recognition? Uh, to claim the time in opposition. A gentleman uh, is recognized in opposition for five minutes. And I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman well, is recognized. I understand the importance of the Department of Defense's role in all this. There are other agencies that also have an important role. Um, and the Natural Resources Committee minority has expressed concerns about this because the Bureau of Land Man Management has their interests as well as a bunch of other federal agencies. So this basically gives the Department of Defense a, you know, a veto power over land use. And that's, you know, I want to make sure the Department of Defense's interests are looked after, but they're not the only interests that exist in our country. Um, so a proper balance of those interests, I think, would be a better approach. And this amendment just says Department of Defense basically gets the ultimate veto, and I think that gives it too much power. Uh, so I prefer to see a more balanced approach uh, and uh, oppose the amendment. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from New Mexico is recognized. Would yield the uh, lady from Tennessee, uh, Ms. Black, uh, a minute and a half. The gentlewoman from Tennessee is recognized for uh, one and a half minutes. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, Mr. Chairman, as a co-chairman of the Congressional Range and Testing Center Caucus, I rise in support of Congressman Pierce's amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, the major range and test facility base is made up of 23 installations across the country, including the Arnold Air Force Base, um, based in Tullahoma, Tennessee. The critical testing and evaluation capabilities of the installations are truly a national asset vital to our security. The testing and evaluation performed at these facilities, though often done behind the scenes, helps to ensure that our men and women in uniform have the equipment and the technologies they need to defend our country. It is vital that we protect these facilities against the various forms of encroachment that can undermine the effectiveness of their operation. My colleague's amendment would ensure that any new use of lands already owned by the federal government around these installations be approved by the Department of Defense. And I urge my colleagues to join me in support of this common sense amendment that strengthens our national security. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from New Mexico reserves. Gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, who has the right to close on this? Washington. The gentleman from Washington okay. uh, will close. I reserve. Gentleman uh, from Washington until. reserves. Gentleman from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would uh, yield one minute to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop. Gentleman from Utah is recognized for one minute. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the uh, invitation from Mr. Uh, Pierce. Like this, this problem illustrates a couple of overwhelming problems we have. One is that agencies don't talk one with another. When the FAA closed towers down, it put three military bases in a difficult situation because they didn't talk. When NASA changed its policy on manned spaceflight, it increased the cost of our missile defense system because the agencies flat out didn't talk. Here's another situation of agencies simply are not working together, which illustrates a second reason why in this bill, when we try to talk about land, we're not talking about withdrawing land so two different agencies have the same land. We're trying to do transfers of land so one agency can make the decisions. In this case, it should be the military. Now, as subcommittee chairman for the Public Lands Committee in um, subcommittee in the resources, I want to say I support this amendment, and I would ask that people would pass this amendment. There may be some areas of trying to change some of the language to limit the scope of what we are doing here, which could easily be done in conference if this amendment is placed on the table in the first place. We already have language in there that deals with white sands, but this amendment would have to be in addition to that. So I would urge my colleagues to actually vote in favor of this. If there are some areas that we need to scope down again, we can easily accomplish that if we have the opportunity of doing so in a conference. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Expired gentleman uh, from New Mexico. Reserves. Gentleman from Washington is. I continue to reserve. I, I have Gen just. Gentleman from Washington reserves. Gentleman from New Mexico is recognized. Mr. Speaker, again, the, the situation is, is quite simple, quite transparent. We're just trying to resolve 
who can make the decisions on land that is owned by one agency and airspace owned by the other. Nowhere else in the U.S., nowhere else in the world do we have this long, uninterrupted range in which we can test weapons. Uh, the recovery of the, the bodies of those weapons gives us great insight into the failures or the successes. And so if we're going to preserve this national asset, this ability to test new and different weapons, then let's, let's get a clear line of understanding. I would urge uh, passage of the amendment and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from New Mexico yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington is recognized to close. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself the balance of my time. And just say, I think recognized. You know, the gentleman from Utah makes a very reasonable point. Certainly, um, one agency shouldn't be shutting something down that has a negative impact on another without consulting them. And perhaps if we work in this amendment to figure out some way where consultation is required, there's some sort of balance. It's just the way this amendment is written, given the Department of Defense. It gives the Department of Defense the ability to do what the gentleman from Utah just said the other agency did, which is just whack it and not talk to anybody else. So we're happy to continue to work on this going forward. In its present form, I am still opposed to it. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New Mexico. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number five, printed in part B of House Report 113-108. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number five, printed in Part B of House Report number 113-108, offered by Mr. Kaufman of Colorado. Pursuant to House Resolution 260, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Kaufman, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, my amendment number 208 cuts $250 million from the Defense Rapid Innovation Program or commonly called DRIP, and it moves the money to alleviate training and readiness shortfalls. The DRIP program is a relatively new program, started by Congress in the wake of the earmark ban in 2010. The funding was not requested by the Department of Defense, and Congress uses the program through DOD to provide grants to small businesses. The funding can be better applied. Yesterday, Deputy Defense Secretary Ash Carter said, the sequester hits particularly hard in the operations and maintenance accounts, and as a result, training is hurt and our nation's military readiness plummets. This is unacceptable. But we can't just bemoan this fact. We have to address it. It is our duty to our men and women in uniform and our nation's security to ensure that we spend our defense dollars in the most efficient and critical way possible. A quarter billion dollars for the DRIP program is not the wisest use of our tax dollars. As a former small business owner, I am naturally very protective of our nation's small businesses. I understand the pressures they operate under, but I am also aware of the effect sequestration is having on our military, military's operations and maintenance accounts. We are seeing across-the-board cuts to vital operational funding. The Air Force grounded 13 squadrons for the year. The Navy has canceled ship deployments and deferred maintenance. The Army has canceled major training exercises for the year. And while I am sure that there have been good results from some of the spending in the DRIP program, I am sure that this program is duplicative of many other efforts in the Department of Defense. There is already $76 million for quick reaction special projects, $62 million for emerging capabilities technology development. $174 million for joint capability technology demonstra demonstrations, and $34 million for the defense-wide manufacturing science and technology program. There is over a billion for Department of Defense small business initiative research funding, and so on, DARPA, joint programs, and technical support programs. Transferring this money will not leave small businesses or technology development without funding. What it will do is signal to the American people that we are willing to make the hard choices necessary to prioritize our men and women in uniform by supporting the operations and maintenance accounts they rely on, and which are, of, which are a higher priority than the potential DRIP uh, results. I repeat, the DRIP program was set up in two t 2010, 
as a way to get around the ban on earmarks. In today's restricted fiscal climate, we have higher defense spending priorities that we should fund instead. I ask for, for your support for this amendment. Gentleman uh, from Colorado reserves the balance of his time. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Washington seek recognition? Rise to claim the, claim the time in opposition. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, if this amendment passes, uh, we will strip away one of the main tools that we have in the defense budget to ensure that small businesses continue to be part of the defense industrial base. The Rapid Innovation Fund was created a couple years ago in order to ensure that small businesses who had technology, who had resources to help the warfighter could get funding to develop that technology, to develop those resources and get service to the warfighter sooner rather than later. In 2011 alone, over 3,500 white papers were submitted and evaluated, proposals for the Rapid Innovation Fund. 3,500, 200 final proposals were invited, and out of that total of 3,500, 177 awards were made, 95 percent of which went to small businesses, 80 percent to current or prior SBIR participants, and the average project value $2.2 million awards to companies in 32 states and in the District of Columbia. This is an important program to help small businesses continue to be part of the defense industrial base. We should not strip RIF funding out of the bill. If we're going to deal with um, operation and maintenance, let's do what everybody on the committee wants to do. Let's stop the sequester, replace the sequester with something more balanced to ensure that the O&M accounts, as well as great programs like RIF, are funded. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every dollar wasted in the defense budget is a, not, is a dollar not spent on defending this country. This is not a program that was ever requested by the Department of Defense. This is a jobs program. And, and I think, given the fact that we're, the Defense Department is under incredible stress, that we've got to fund the priorities that our men and women on the front lines need. And that is putting this $250 million to operation and maintenance, $250, this spending program that is already duplicated in other parts of the uh, Department of Defense budget. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, uh, I yield back but reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman uh, reserves Speaker. the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Do you ask how much time I have left? The gentleman from Washington has three and a half minutes. The gentleman from Colorado has a minute, one and a half minutes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, I'd like to yield uh, uh, one minute to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Schuster. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for one minute. Uh, I thank the gentleman, and I just want to uh, echo what the gentleman from Washington said. This is an extremely important program to small business that operates in the defense industrial base, and we are making it more and more difficult for them to operate. This fund, the Rapid Innovation Fund, is just the solution to keeping them involved in the innovation and coming out with new products, faster products. So in the long run, this is going to save money. It's going to have new products the warfighters need. Uh, this fund has been very important to them. Uh, Mr. Larson and I chaired a panel on this panel on business challenges, the defense industry. We traveled this country, listened to the small businesses, and this was what they asked for. They were, it was so important to the development of their products. And in fact, when we started this, we had Secretary Rumsfeld come before the committee and say, when I asked him, what would you recommend to small business Businesses, to businesses doing business with the Department of Defense, and he'd say, I recommend they don't do business. It's so difficult. In fact, he said it's like sleeping with a hippopotamus. Eventually, it's going to roll over and crush you, and it'll never know that it did it. So this is extremely important to the small business community to keep them engaged. The big defense contractors need the small folks. They're developing and innovating. So I urge a, a no vote Gentleman's on the Kaufman Amendment. I yield back. Uh, Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Washington reserves. Gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Mr. Speaker, the question before us in an environment of limited resources is whether we fund an economic development program for small business, and as a former small business owner, I certainly would think under normal circumstances that would be important, but we're doing it out of the Department of Defense budget. And we're doing it at the expense of priorities within the Department of Defense. 
and the Department of Defense is not asking for this program. The, what the Department of Defense is saying is that there, there are shortages in funding operations and maintenance. And so I believe that it's critically important uh, to take this $250 million that the Department of Defense is now requesting and putting it into an area where they are requesting. And, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I yield back, but reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back, reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield uh, a minute to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez. Generally, uh, gentlewoman from California is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in opposition to this amendment. I understand my colleagues' um, concern with uh, shortfall in departments, operations, and maintenance accounts, but that's really a product of sequestration. What we're really talking about is innovation here. And innovation generally doesn't happen in the big companies. It happens in the small companies, the companies that are able to move uh, quickly so that we get what we need. And that's what the RIF program is about. This is not an earmark. 